Hey, we're gonna go ahead and dive in today. Um, there's, it's gonna sound weird. There's very little to cover, but it's gonna take us a minute um, because I don't want us to miss the simplicity of what God has given us today. Um, but I do wanna start out with a Cooperism. Some of you have asked, when are you gonna talk about Cooper? Cooper is one of my 14-year-old twins that, look, I still say this, he's here now. Um, anyway, if you don't know anything about Cooper, Cooper is in a world of his own, and he's happy there. You never know what's gonna come out of his mouth. Um, so this past Friday, we were getting ready, and um, we're gonna talk about this again in just a moment, but we were cutting grass, getting ready to chop up some leaves, and I had to put some air in one of the tires on my truck, and so we pulled over at the gas station, and me and Cooper were outside getting the air um, to the appropriate pressure in my tire, and then all of a sudden we filled it up, and obviously the air compressor is still running at the store. We paid a dollar and fifty cents, which is absolute ridiculous, by the way. Um, and so it was still running, and I'm putting the valve stem back on, and Cooper out of nowhere goes, "Daddy, you think we can get our money back?" And I said, "Why, buddy?" He goes, "We didn't use all the air." Pretty logical way to think. I think he'll be the first millionaire in the Hall household. Um, but that's just, that's Cooper. That's who he is. Uh, but this morning, I want to start out by sharing a story that references us cutting grass and cutting leaves like we always do, because it will set the stage for what James is going to talk about today in James chapter 2. Um, you know, me and the boys, this is just something that we do. I would say we love to do it. We do love to do it in the spring, but by the time it gets this time of year, you despise it and you pray you never have to cut grass again. Um, if you've cut grass, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We've got a dozen or so yards that we take care of, and now that Brock has turned 16, they've got this bright idea that they wanna get their own yards. They don't need daddy anymore. Although they're gonna use my lawnmower, my weed eater, my blower, my trailer, everything, but I'm blessings to you boys, have at it. And so what they wanted to do is they wanna go out and start asking for their own yards now. And so over the summer, while the kids were actually at student camp, Chelsea and I were in our neighborhood with Easton and Deacon and we were riding the golf cart and we discovered that a, a very well-known athlete, professional athlete lives in our neighborhood. And so as we realized who this individual was, and I'm not gonna share their name just for, you know, whatever reason. Anyway, so we get back to the house, we go to the summer camp, and I'm telling the boys, you aren't gonna believe who lives in our neighborhood, but boys, the one thing I noticed, his grass needed cut. And so they get home from summer camp, Brock decides one Sunday afternoon, we're sitting on the back porch, and Brock says, Dad, I'm gonna ask this individual if I can go get their, if I can start cutting their grass. I said, all right, have at it, buddy. Good luck. In my mind, I'm going, no way this is going to happen. And so Brock gets ready to leave, and then he comes back to the back porch, and he says, Daddy, I've never tried to get a yard. What do I say? How do I do this? And I said, well, buddy, I said, when it comes to stuff like this, they're probably going to want a referral. They're going to want a visual to see if you can even cut grass. And I said, so here's what you tell him. Tell him that we live in the first house on the right in our neighborhood, and we cut the next two yards. And so the first three yards in our neighborhood, we take care of those. And so every day he drives by, he can use that as a referral. So just tell him that we cut the first three yards on the right in our neighborhood. Okay, Daddy, I got it. He's gone literally for like six minutes, and he comes running back to the house, pouring sweat, so excited. He jumps up and gives a big heel kick in the backyard, and he says, we just got our first yard. And I was so excited for him. I was in shock because I couldn't believe they got it. And then all of a sudden, I said, well, Brock, how did the conversation go? He said, oh, Daddy, it was terrible. I butchered it. I said, well, how, buddy? He said, well, when I saw who it was, when I saw this big shadow coming down the hallway, coming to the front door, Daddy, my hands started sweating. I got nervous, and I couldn't even talk. And then all of a sudden, he comes to the door, and he introduces himself, and he says, hey, guys, how can I help you? And Brock says, um, well, me and my brother are trying to get a couple of yards in our neighborhood, and, and I know you probably want to know how good we are at cutting grass, and just so you know, we live in the first three houses on the right. And the guy looked at him and he said, do what? And he said, I mean, I mean, I mean, we, we cut the, free, the first three houses and we live in the first one. 
And so the guy laughed and he said, and, brought, and the guy said, he goes, well, actually, I have a company coming to cut my grass tomorrow. However, I'm gonna fire them and I'm gonna let y'all do it. And so now all summer long, my boys had been cutting the grass of the guy that Brock butchered um, the sales pitch. Um, so he will never be in sales, I guess. Um, and to be honest with you, when Brock came back and he shared that with me, I thought, how ridiculous that Brock got that nervous. That's just a human being. And then I realized that the day me and my wife discovered who it was, we acted the same way. We did a U-turn in the middle of the road of the golf cart. I told her, I said, pull out your phone, take some selfies of this guy, like hurry. And so she, we're driving by and we're those creepers. She's got her phone pushing the picture button. And I realized, I'm like, we've done the same thing. Why do I think it's ridiculous what Brock did? But all that being said, you know, we acted towards this individual differently because of his accomplishments, because of his, um, the assumption of his wealth. And what you're gonna see in today in James chapter two, James says, you can't do this. James says, you can't do this. There's no need for this. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna read a lengthy passage. And when I say that, it's 13 verses and it's lengthy in comparison to last week because we looked at two verses. But we're gonna look at this passage of scripture in verses one through 13. And while it seems to be a lengthy passage, what I'm excited to share with you today, I believe is a very, very short and clear message. And so I want you to read with me in James chapter two, verses one through 13. Remember, he's addressing the believer, and we'll talk about that again in just a little while. But he says, my brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For as someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes also comes in. If you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and you say, sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, stand over there or sit on the floor by my footstool, haven't you made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, didn't God choose the poor in this world to, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Verse six, Yet you who have dishonored the poor, don't the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Don't they blaspheme the good name that was invoked over you? Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the entire law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you are a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Lastly, mercy triumphs over judgment. While I know that there's gonna be a lot of you that when you look at these verses one through 13, you know as well as I do, there is a lot in this passage. There's a lot of different directions we could go. We could spend days and days and days just in these 13 verses. But what I wanna do today is share the simplest message based off these 13 verses. But before we dive into the meaning of what's taking place here, I want us to look at the example that James sets up as he references those who show favoritism. Now keep in mind, a lot of scholars believe that this scenario that James is talking about is, is a hypothetical, that it's just a, a, an opportunity as a teachable point that he can help the believers see what they're falling short of. And he says there, this hypothetical, he says there's some entering your meeting some of your Bibles probably say the assembly. And what they would be referencing would be the place as they would enter called the synagogue. And this is the place that the Jews would gather and, and they would pray and they would read scripture and they would worship. And it, this example that they're sharing is exactly what we're doing here today. 
is exactly what James is referencing in this context. And so we see that the difference, though, is that in the synagogues in the New Testament, they were very strategically mapped out as far as where everyone would sit. And so obviously you had the freedom to walk in today and sit wherever you wanted to. However, that was not the case in the synagogues. And, and just to give you some of the examples, um, the examples that were, that were in the context of what I've read about all week is that in the synagogues, the women would be placed in what you and I would call the nosebleed section. They would be placed on the outskirts of the synagogue, per se. The men would be allowed to sit in the floor in their seats, in their appropriate places, sort of front and center of what we would know as the stage or the pulpit. Then there was another element, another layer of importance that there was a section up front that would be for the wealthy, that would be for those who had a very high reputation in the community or the society. Maybe they were very wealthy. Maybe they were very well-known. Maybe they had a lot of influence. And so we see how the synagogue, it was strategically organized as to where everyone would sit based off their importance in society and in the culture. And so now that the stage of the synagogue is set, James says, here's the situation. The synagogue is here. Everybody's sitting where they're supposed to be. And now there's two type people that are gonna walk in. There's a rich man and a poor man. The rich man is ushered down front to sit in the important section. The rich man gets to sit with those who had earned their credibility and their popularity. And so they were able to join up front based off their accomplishments as well. And so as they did this, those people that were being ushered down front, they were acknowledged just organically by those in the room as they would see them make their way up front. They would say, oh, well, that must be an important person. That must be a wealthy person. That must be a person of, of high influence. And so people would take note of that. People would notice it. But there was also an element of selfishness in it because the leaders of the synagogues were the ones who got to usher the people to sit down front. And so now there's almost that element of, look who's at our synagogue today. And so now they're getting the credibility. Now they're also getting the popularity because of the person that they're ushering down front. So, so there's also some selfish motives for the leaders as they would place these important people in their seats. But then there's the rich man or the poor man. And they're told, hey, go stand over there. Or you can have a seat on the floor beside my footstool. And a lot of scholars believe that there was almost an element of shame to the religious leaders that they were sort of ashamed who was at the synagogue. Like they're not very important. They don't have anything. So you just sort of head on over there. You just sort of slide over to the side. And they didn't fit. They didn't fit the bill of those that were wealthy that were allowed to sit down front. And at the same time, these leaders were ashamed that they were even in the house that day. And so this example, this hypothetical that James has set up is exactly what James is referring to as this word favoritism. Now, if we're completely transparent with one another today, if we're completely honest with one another, every single person in this room is guilty of showing favoritism at some level. Because you see, the, the, the word favoritism in the original language was defined as this, to receive someone according to the face, meaning that you receive them at face value. You make a blanket judgment based off their first appearance, the very first thing you see about them. And in light of favoritism, James is very intentional with what he says next. He says, don't do it. And in the context, if you break the word down, he would literally be saying, stop doing this, which means that they were guilty of actively showing favoritism, that the believer, the church, was actively showing favoritism to the rich and the poor. And so while we understand this, this, this concept of favoritism is something that honestly is sort of wired in us as sinners, and it's something that our world and our culture feeds. This, this idea 
that certain people are on different levels. And this is the evidence that our human nature and ourself is exactly what we talked about last week. We're stained by the world. We're influenced by the world. We're influenced by the culture. And I would love to do this, but I'm not going to, but I could prove this point to be true. I would bet you, not, not that I'm a gambler, but I would bet you that by one or two posts on social media this week, that we could absolutely pack this house out next Sunday. No questions asked. There wouldn't be a seat in the house. We would probably have to go to three to four services. Do you know, you know how we could do this? I could get Breland Millwood to post on our social media Hey, special guest at Chestnut Mountain Church next Sunday. Taylor Swift is gonna be in the house. <laughs> guess what would happen? Now, I agree. I would stay home. <laughs> However, our culture and our society would not. Look, Donna's loving this. She's like, are you really gonna do that? <laughs> Donna's so excited. She's over there going, Tony, listen. You're gonna have to wear pants next week, Tony, not just shorts. You've gotta really dress up next Sunday because Taylor Swift is coming to church. Just kidding. Or maybe Taylor Swift's a bad example. Look, I know yesterday was a big football day and I know a lot of you, I could probably say or post on social media, Kirby Smart's gonna be in the house next Sunday. This place would fill up. I could say Nick Saban is gonna be in the house, right, Neil? Okay, <laughs> praise God, yeah. Whew, that was terrible. Fourth and 30? Anyway. <laughs> Woo, Ron. Look, Ron. Anyway, let's, okay. Y'all are, look, y'all are getting me sidetracked. I, this is not good for my ADHD, okay? I'm staying focused on what God's word says. My point being, we could advertise any single person that was gonna be on our campus next Sunday and we would fill this place up because people would wanna come and see who it is. People would wanna be in their presence. People would want to just lay eyes on them. For me as a kid, if you told me Michael Jordan was gonna be here, I would be here 100% and I would find a seat right beside him. But the reality is, is this is something that we're all guilty of. We all categorize people based off their accomplishments based off their wealth, based off their fame. And according to what James says right here in chapter two, verse one, he says, stop it. There's no point in it. There's no point in showing favoritism. And so what I wanna do, I know we read 13 verses, but I believe everything we need to know about this passage is found in verse one. It's found in verse one. And so I'm gonna read verse one again. He starts out and he says, my brothers and sisters. So first and foremost, we know that this is to the church. This is to the believers. Then he says, do not show favoritism. Stop showing favoritism. Stop putting people on pedestals. But then what you see in the remainder of the verse is he tells us and gives us the instruction on how we do this, how we avoid favoritism. And he says here, as you hold on to the faith in our, listen, glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Some of your Bibles may say the Lord of glory. But what I found in studying this week is James was very, very intentional on the placement of that adjective because it could simply read, hold on to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, right? That would still say the same message, but it wouldn't carry near the weight that it does when James talks about who Jesus Christ is. He says, hold on to the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. This one word changes the entire weight of the rest of this passage because this one word puts into perspective who Jesus is. 
This one word defines the person of Jesus Christ. This word glorious, or your Bible may say Lord of glory, this word is defined by splendor, by the brightness, by the magnificence, or by the excellence. To expand on it even more, this is majesty in the sense of absolute perfection. Another example is this is the most glorious, exalted state. And the reason that James is so emphatic on making sure this word glorious is found in the scripture is because as we remind ourselves of the holiness of Jesus Christ, as we remind ourselves of the perfection of Jesus Christ, as we remind ourselves of his love, his sacrifice, and when all this is brought to a place of understanding of who Jesus is and that he is supreme, we realize that he is the only one worthy of being exalted the only one worthy of being lifted up. And so this word glorious, it simply reminds us of who he is while at the same time reminding us of who man is not. It puts into perspective the person of Jesus Christ, but it also puts into perspective the condition of man. You see, this is a principle that Jesus also talked about. When the disciples went to Jesus and they asked him, how do we pray? How do we pray? Jesus started out the prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, and translated, holy is your name. Do we pray that way to remind God who he is? Do I pray that God, that, that I, in my language of praying to the Lord, do I say, God, you are holy. God, you are righteous. God, you are love. I thank you for the sacrifice. Do I say all of those things as if God needs to be reminded of who he is? No, I don't. But as I pray this way, as I begin my prayer, declaring the God of heaven, the one who is holy, the one who is righteous, the one who is my provider, the one who is my salvation, the one who is my sacrifice. As I acknowledge that, it postures my heart into a place of knowing who he is and knowing that I am nothing without him. That's the reason that Jesus teaches the disciples to pray this way. Remind yourself of God's holiness. I love what the psalmist writes in Psalms 100. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. But this is the same angle, if you would. Psalms 100, verse one. Let the whole earth shout and triumphly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge the Lord is God. He made us. We are his, his people the sheep of his pasture, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, giving thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generation. The psalmist is reminding us by this element of worship of who God is and the very one that we lift up. That's the purpose of Psalms being written this way. That's the purpose of us standing this morning with, with lights, with the music, with, with the lyrics of the songs that we sing. It's not so that we can sing praises to remind God who he is, but it's simply to posture our hearts so that we can acknowledge who he is. And it positions us in a place of humility where we are brought to a place of saying, God, I'm nothing without you. God, I'm nothing without you. And that's the very reason we start out every Sunday with praise, with worship. The Bible tells us to enter his courts with thanksgiving, to enter his courts with praise. And the purpose of that is because as our awareness of Jesus' glory increases, the glory of man decreases. As we acknowledge Jesus' glory, the glory of man quickly decreases. 
Francis Chan gave an example in a message that he preached that I listened to this past week. And I think this is something that we could all relate to. Let's just say this morning that you had the opportunity to sit beside your most admired figure on planet Earth. Whether it's a movie star, whether it's an athlete, whether it's a singer, whomever it is, just imagine that they're sitting beside you right now in this worship service. And I come out on the stage and I open the word of God and I begin to preach with all the passion and conviction that I have. As super spiritual as that sound, let's just be real honest. If that person sitting beside you, you ain't gonna hear a word I say because you're overwhelmed with who's sitting beside you. I would guarantee you that your worship would even look different because you're so overwhelmed with who's sitting beside you, maybe in a part of the song that you feel compelled to lift your hands to praise, or maybe you feel compelled to come to the altar to pray. You're gonna stay seated. You're gonna sit just like this because in your mind you're going, I wonder what they think about me. And you're nervous and your hands are sweating. You're overwhelmed because who's in your presence? And so you hear me every week. You're not gonna pay me a lot of attention because you're gonna be so infatuated with this person that you have on this pedestal beside you. Now, let's flip the coin. Hypothetically speaking, let's say that same individual is sitting beside you. And I come out on stage. Remember, hypothetically speaking. And I announce to you that there's a special guest that is gonna come and preach this morning. And you're gonna recognize him the moment he walks out because of the scars that are in his hand. You're gonna recognize him because of the glory of the Lord that has encompassed him. You're gonna recognize him by his resurrected body. Can I tell you all of a sudden, the glory of that individual beside you immediately decreases if you're a child of God. Because in that moment, you will realize that is the one who gave us all for me. That is the one who bled. That is the one who died. That is the one who overcame death, hell, and the grave so that I could be reconciled to the Father, so that I could have life everlasting. And in just a moment, that person beside you is a lot less important because just in that moment, you begin to discover on this earth, on this planet that we live on every single day, there's Jesus and then there's everybody else. And we often say that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That at the end of the day, in comparison to Jesus, no one compares. And so each week as we stand and we sing of his attributes, we sing of his glory, we sing of his forgiveness, it's done so that we realize that he's the only one worthy to be placed on a pedestal, to be exalted, to be lifted up. And when we stand in the presence of God, in the context of showing favoritism to the rich and the poor, what we all begin to realize is that when we acknowledge his glory, very quickly we realize that there is no one who's rich, who's poor, who's divorced, who's married, who's black or white, who's an addict, who's an overcomer. At the end of the day, every person that we just named is undone without the Savior of the world. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. And that is the context of the ground is level at the foot of the cross. At the end of the day, we're all on the same page. It don't matter how much money you make. It don't matter how good of an athlete you are. We were all sheep without a shepherd. And praise be unto God, by the blood of the lamb and only by the blood of the lamb, we have been brought into the flock of a father who loves us. It was not based off how good you are. 
It wasn't based off how much money's in the bank. It wasn't based off how good of an athlete you are. It doesn't matter how high you've climbed the corporate ladder. At the end of the day, God loved you. And while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die. That's the gospel in a nutshell. So the way we avoid favoritism, very simple. Always remind yourself of the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Always remind yourself of who he is because when you remind yourself of who he is, we quickly understand who we are not, much less who everybody else is not. And what we have to do we gotta realize that when we're in the house of God, it's not about anyone here. It's not about any person. It's not about any individual. When we're in the house of God, we've gotta understand that it's all about him. But sadly enough, that's not the case of those who James is writing to. They're guilty of showing favoritism. And we kind of tear it all down and break it all down. We realize that the reason they're showing favoritism is that there's something in it for them. There's something in it for them. You know, maybe they could receive attention. Maybe they could receive credibility or status. Or maybe they could even receive a little money but they showed favoritism because there was something in it for them. But when we're in the house of God, at the end of the day, the rich and the poor should all be treated the same. Because without the Lord Jesus Christ, we're all broke. We're all undone. And this was very hard for these religious leaders to do this. They had a hard time loving everybody when there wasn't anything in it for them. And we talked about this last week in my small group. You know, as we talked about the definition of pure and undefiled religion last week, and we talked about the evidence of pure and undefiled religion is when the believer takes care of the widows and the orphans. And we talked about that, that they were in the most hopeless condition, the most helpless condition. But one of the other things that we didn't unpack was one of the reason that James calls the church to take care of the widows and orphans is because it helps very quickly to define our motives. You see, there was nothing in it for us as we serve the widows and orphans. In the context of the scripture, that widow and that orphan had nothing to give back. So are we willing to love people right where they're at when they have nothing to offer us? That's exactly what James is talking about. They are called to treat the poor the same as they do the rich, even if the poor have nothing to give in return. Are we willing to love people when there's nothing in it for us? That's what Jesus did, and that's why the religious leaders had such a hard time with him. We see all throughout the scriptures that he ate with sinners. Jesus never showed favoritism. He didn't care because he saw every individual of the condition that we talked about a while ago lost that needed to be found. That's how he saw everybody. James speaks to this in verse eight and nine of this chapter. Indeed, if you fulfill the law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law of the transgressors. Jesus then even expounds on this in verse uh, th chapter 13 of the Gospel of John. If you've got your Bible, I want you to turn there right quick, and this is what we're going to share in closing today. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. I give you a new command love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And by this, everyone will know 
that you are my disciples if you make a lot of money, if you sit in the reserve seated section, if you're the greatest athlete on the planet. Nope. They will know if you love one another. They'll know if you don't show favoritism. They'll know if you love and accept everyone. So you ask the question, well, Brian, how I struggle with favoritism. How do I overcome favoritism? Always remind yourself of the glory of who Jesus is. Remind yourself that you're nothing without him. Remind yourself that you were once a sheep without a shepherd. And then James gives one little more plug at the very end to help motivate us. I love how he ends verse 13 or verse 12 and 13. Speak as those, oh never, yeah, speak as to those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy, but my triumph, but mercy triumphs over judgment. You see, what James is talking about here is that every person in this room will stand and be judged by God. Every person, there's no escape. It doesn't matter if you believe or you don't believe. You will stand in judgment of God. But praise be unto God for the child of God. You will be judged with mercy. And the reason that you will be judged with mercy is not because you've overcome, not because you're this perfect person. The reason that you will be judged with mercy is because you've placed your faith in the finished work of what Jesus has done. That's it. That's the only way you receive the mercy of God is where is your faith? And so if you, as a child of God, have been extended mercy, and mercy means that you're giving what's not deserved. You see, we all deserve death. But praise be unto God, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have life. And so we will be extended mercy by where our faith is placed. And so as a child of God today, are you extending mercy? Are you guilty of favoritism? You know, because can we be real honest? If people hurt us, sometimes it's hard to extend mercy. It's hard to extend forgiveness. Because in our minds, we think they don't deserve it. I struggle with it. I hope you too, too, just so I don't feel so bad. And so what God has reminded me of this entire week, maybe you're having troubles with individuals and as I say this often, it may be somebody in this room that you're treating different. You know how you deal with it? Remind yourself of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remind yourself. And, and so we're gonna end this morning a lot differently. Because normally we have a time of response where it's a time of brokenness, where it's a time of, and yes, if you're broken and you wanna come pray, we ask that you, you move as the Holy Spirit leads you to move. But I think what is so important today to help us get over this idea of favoritism, to help us get over this idea of forgiveness and extending mercy is what we're gonna do this morning is we're gonna take some time and remind ourselves of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ.
And so as I was thinking about just a moment ago, I was, I was almost ready to run. But I didn't want to pull a hamstring. But the way you overcome favoritism is you sing, your cross is my freedom. You sing that your stripes are my healing. You sing that your blood is still speaking and you sing that your love is still reaching and then all praise will be given to Jesus, all glory to God in heaven. So the way we overcome favoritism is we remind ourselves of who we are in Christ Jesus, that we are lost and undone without a savior. And so I wanna invite you this morning to stand to your feet. And look, I know a lot of you were yelling and screaming at TVs last night, maybe all day yesterday. What would this place look like if we worshiped our Lord and Savior with the same energy that we cheered for our football teams? Can I tell you that football team has done nothing for you but give you a headache and cause you a whole lot of stress? But praise be unto God that the cross, the cross is everything to a child of God. That without the blood of the lamb, you are nothing. And so this morning, I want us to posture our hearts in a place of humility and remind ourselves of who we are and that we are nothing without him. And let this empower us to love people right where they're at. No matter how they've hurt us, no matter what's going on, but you feel free this morning to worship and remind yourself of who the Son of God is today.